Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship with prayer. Light of the world, shine upon us this night. Shine in our lives that we may shine with your love. Shine in our world that your light may overcome all darkness and fear. Shine through our worship that our souls may be strengthened with the power of your light and love. In the name and love we pray. Amen. I'm sure you'll recognize our anthem, O Come All Ye Faithful, brought to us by Joe McCreary, our director of music, and one of our homegrown, Brandon Holt. Right on cue, I'm inviting Betsy Mills and her daughters, Rebecca and Emily, for the lighting of the Christmas candle. Advent hope moves us. Advent love leads us. Advent joy stirs us. Advent peace stills us, that we may affirm our King Jesus. It is time we set flame to this Advent affirmation by lighting the Christ candle. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He was born of the Virgin Mary in Bethlehem of Judea, he was the long-awaited Messiah whose coming was prophesied. The same Jesus lives today in our hearts. He deserves our highest loyalty and total commitment. In Jesus Christ, our hope is fulfilled, our love is consummated, and our joy is complete, and our peace is sealed. Rejoice! A Savior is born. A Savior is born indeed. Joy to the world. Our Old Testament reading is by the prophet Isaiah, is Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. 
On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Thanks be to God and Merry Christmas to each and every one of you. Hear now the story of the birth of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, born in Bethlehem. Will you, in honor of the reading, assume a posture of resurrection that is by standing as the reading unfolds? And it came to pass in those days that there went out for a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was made first when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. To be taxed with his espoused wife, being great with child, and so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign to you. You shall find him wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And it came to pass, as the angels were gone away from them unto heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem, 
and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying that was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at these things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying God and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it was told unto them. May God add a blessing to the reading of this word. I'm grateful to Bishop Will Willimon for inspiration behind tonight's homily because he said that in his house, it's not Christmas unless someone reads Barbara Robinson's little 1970 book, The Best Christmas Pageant Ever. Do you know that one? I'm indebted to him because he reminded me that this best Christmas pageant ever is a funny, irreverent, but poignant telling of a children's Christmas pageant at Second Presbyterian Church in an unknown town, in which the chief culprits of the whole pageant are, as described by the narrator, the horrible children of the Herdman family. They were the absolutely worst kids in the history of the world, to hear the book say it. They lied and stole and smoked cigars, even the girls. And they talked dirty and hit little kids and cursed their teachers and took the Lord's name in vain. Oh, the Herdmans, Ralph, Imogene, Leroy, Claude, Ollie, and Gladys, who lived over an unused garage at the bottom of Spruill Hill. You know, I thought about Christmas pageants, and I remember being a bit of a snob about children's Christmas pageants for a while. I've lamented these theatrical travesties that have become as much a part of Yuletide as indigestion. In the usual year, and unlike in this year, scores of church fellowship halls throughout the land are filled with eight-year-old boys in their father's bathrobes, their mother's sandals, with shoe polish for beards, walking up to cardboard mangers to be greeted by sullen-looking 11-year-old Josephs and besheeted Marys, who were being watched over by tinsel and glitter glue blonde angels 
in twin bedsheets. But with the help of the best Christmas pageant ever, I've come to a different opinion of these Christmas pageants. My theory is that if you may never understand the Christmas story until you've seen it done or undone by the kindergarten through sixth grade church school class as only they can do it. You know how we adults usually conceive of the nativity in, the, in our imaginations. In our minds, the people of that first Christmas story come out looking pious and religious and noble. Mary, Joseph, the shepherds, they seem to be so sure of what they're doing, knowing exactly when to come on to the world stage, as if they've been carefully rehearsing their parts for 2,000 years. They all make their appearances on cue. The shepherds are met by the angels. Who, the shepherds confidently go to the stable where Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus are all cleaned up and waiting for them. They receive a few wise men from the east who then exit majestically toward Egypt by another way. And that's what we adults picture in our minds how the pageant would go. The problem is we've heard it and read it so many times over and over again that we've come to expect that it all just goes right. Mary isn't surprised when the angel tells her she's expecting a child. Mary accepts that she's blessed. Joseph is told not to fear, but why? He doesn't seem to anyway. In our minds, he's not confused or embarrassed. We know the story will end well. It will all go off without a hitch, and we'll all go home and have a wonderful Christmas Eve, knowing that everybody in Bethlehem was in complete control. At least that's the way we religious people are supposed to think of it. But the disarming thing about a children's Christmas pageant is that it hardly ever comes off as planned, no matter how fine the bathrobes and how professional the makeup job and no matter the quality of hay deposited on the stage, invariably something goes wrong. Mary, Joseph, and the rest of the cast never seem to look as dignified or religious as we expect them to look. They never look like those figures on the front of those Christmas cards or in Grandma's big family Bible with all the pictures. Usually when the children put it together, the shepherds act as confused and dumbfounded as the sheep. The wise men look overly dressed, but they don't look all that wise. 11-year-old Joseph is so embarrassed to be standing that close to Mary, or any girl for that matter. And Mary, despite her efforts, always looks like she feels awkward too, like she's about to giggle, and she doesn't have the slightest idea how to hold a baby. Let's hear how the rehearsal went in the best Christmas pageant ever. Mother said, and here's the Herdman family. We're glad to see you all, which was probably the biggest lie ever said out loud in church. Imogene smiled that wry Herdman smile, we called it. And there they sat, the closest thing to criminals that we knew of. And they were going to represent the best and the most beautiful in our Christmas pageant. No wonder everybody at the church was so worked up. Mother started to separate everyone into angels and shepherds and guests at the inn. But right away, she ran into trouble. Who were the shepherds, Leroy Herman wanted to know? Where did they come from? Ollie Herman said he didn't even know what a shepherd was. What was the inn called, Herman said. What's an inn? It's like a motel, somebody said, where people go to spend the night. What people, Claude said, Jesus? Oh, honestly, Alice Wendelkin grumbled. Jesus wasn't even born yet. Mary and Joseph went there. Why, Ralph Herdman asked, what happened first? The thing was, you see, the Herdmans didn't know anything about the Christmas story. They knew that Christmas was Jesus' birthday, but everything else was news to them. The shepherds, the wise men, the star, the stable, the crowded inn. They never came to church in their whole life till your brother told them we have refreshments at Sunday school, Alice said. And all you ever hear about at Christmas in school is how to make ornaments out of aluminum foil. So how would they know about the Christmas story? 
Mother said she'd better begin by reading the story out of the Bible. Now, this was a pain in the neck to most of us because we knew the whole thing backwards and forwards and never had to be told anything except who we were supposed to be and where we were supposed to stand. But she began. Joseph and Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. Pregnant, yelled Ralph Herdman. Well, that stirred everything up. All the big kids began to giggle, and the little kids wanted to know what was so funny, and Mother had to hammer on the floor with a blackboard pointer. That's enough, Ralph, she said, and went on with the story. I don't think it's very nice to say Mary was pregnant, Alice whispered to me. But she was, I pointed out. In a way, though, I agreed with her. It sounded too ordinary. Anybody could be pregnant. Great with child sounded better for Mary. I'm not supposed to talk about people being pregnant. Alice folded her hands in her lap and pinched her lips together. I'd better tell my mother. Tell her what? Tell her your mother's talking about things like that in church. My mother wouldn't like me to want to be here. I was pretty sure she would too do it. She wanted Mary and she was mad. She wanted her to be Mary and she was mad at her mother. I knew too she would make it sound worse than it was. And when Miss Wendelkin would get madder than she already was. Miss Wendelkin didn't even want cats to have kittens or birds to lay eggs, and she wouldn't let Alice play with anybody who had two rabbits. So you know the Christmas pageants are usually cute, laughable, comic, sometimes ridiculous. But rarely are they as we imagine the first Christmas scene was. Or were they? I remember children going through a Christmas pageant, and it occurred to me suddenly that maybe this wasn't exactly how Saint, this was exactly how St. Luke was trying to say that it really happened. Because it could not have been as tied down and neat and religious as we like to picture it. Whatever that first Christmas was, it had to be a little confusing, a little unnerving, a little disarming, because it had to do with, with God, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the Prince of Peace, coming down to us in flesh. And if that doesn't strike you as odd, I don't know what will. I imagine that on that first Christmas, that first time in Bethlehem, everyone involved felt like they were in over their heads. They wondered if they were people going and getting caught out in the world stage. They didn't have any time to rehearse like the children in Christmas pageants do. No time to strike a sufficiently religious pose or a pious position. Or to act as if you knew at all what you were doing. Christmas just kind of swept up on them, Mary and Joseph and the shepherds. It kind of swept them along. Think about it today. This is how God is among us. This is Emmanuel. Like Mary and Joseph, we're going about our busy lives. We're home wrapping packages. We're signing Christmas cards. We're setting our DVRs and paying our credit card bills. We're plodding through the everydayness of our lives in our own small ways. And then God chooses to reveal something of himself to the world. To perform some act of love or courage through us. And to come in the person of Jesus Christ who is born. This very evening. And we get pushed onto the stage of history ourselves, friends, to act out our parts as best we can, to try to fill roles and costumes that are too big for us, it feels. That is when Emmanuel happens for us. So, in the best Christmas pageant ever, the Pageant evening finally arrives. Our young narrator picks up the story. She said there was the usual mess all over the place. Baby angels getting knocked and poked in the eye by other baby angels' wings. And grumpy shepherds stumbling over their bathrobes. And the spotlight in the fellowship hall swooped up and forth and down until it made you sick to look at your stomach. And as usual, whoever was playing the piano pitched away in the manger so high nobody could hear it, let alone sing it. It suddenly occurred to me that this must have been the way it was for the real Holy Family. Stuck away in a barn by people who didn't care much what happened to them. 
They couldn't have been very neat and tidy either, but more like this Herdman, Mary, and Joseph. Imogene Herdman's veil was cockeyed, and Ralph's hair stuck out all around his ears. And Imogene had the baby doll, but she wasn't carrying it the way she was supposed to, cradled in her arms. She had it slung up over her shoulder, and before she put it in the manger, she thumped it twice on the back. And I heard Alice Wendell can poke me and say, I don't think it's very nice to burp the baby Jesus, she whispered, as if he had colic. And then she poked me again. Do you suppose he could have had colic? I said, I don't know why not. He could have had colic or been fussy or hungry like any other baby. After all, that was the whole point of Jesus, that he didn't come down on a, on a cloud or out of the sky like in the action comics. He was born and lived like a real person. Everyone had been waiting all this time for the Herdmans to do something so absolutely unexpected. And sure enough, that's what happened. Because Imogene Herdman, who was Mary, was crying. In the candlelight, her face was all shiny with tears and she didn't bother to wipe any of them away. She just sat there, awful old mean Imogene, in her crookedy veil, just crying and crying and crying. Well, it was the best Christmas pageant we ever had. Everybody said so, but nobody could seem to say why. When it was over, people stood around in the lobby of the fellowship hall talking about what was different this year. There was something special, everyone said. They couldn't put their finger on what. And that was the funny thing about it all. For years, I'd thought about the wonder of Christmas and the mystery of Jesus' birth, and it never really understood it. But now, because of the Herdmans, it didn't seem so mysterious at all, she said. When Imogene had asked me what the pageant was about, I told her it was about Jesus, but that was just part of it. It was about a new baby and his mother and his father who were in a lot of trouble and no money and no place to go, no doctor, nobody they knew. And then arriving from the east, like my uncle from New Jersey, came some rich friends. But for Imogene, Christmas just came all over her at once, like a case of the chills or a fever. And so she was just crying. So sisters and brothers, on this Christmas Eve, if by chance in this Yuletide some angel, some angelic messenger visits you, be it Gabriel himself or some besheeted pageant angel wearing a bedsheet over tennis shoes and blue jeans, May the word that the angel said be true for you. Hail, O favored ones. The Lord is with you. And you. And you. And you. Jesus, I ask thee 
to stay close by me forever and love me, I pray. Bless all the dear children in thy tender care and fit us for heaven to live with thee Sisters and brothers in Christ, for months we have observed, some of us, a fast from Holy Communion, and then we were able to worship in the sanctuary again, and we've been able to have communion again. And during this time, we've been reminded of how important the Eucharist is to our spirits. It's a sharing in Christ's body and soul. For those of us in the sanctuary this evening, these elements you will find in the hymnal rack in front of you or along the pew beside you. You may have to look around. Take a moment, and I, my ushers are going to watch and make sure you have, everybody has one, one. Everybody found one? All right. Thank you, my friends. Even the musicians have them, don't they? <laughs> okay, good. Now, uh, I will lead us here in this room in a liturgy, and then I'll guide you through partaking and how to open the top. But for those watching online, because we United Methodists emphasize the presence of the elements themselves. When I preside over communion here, I'm blessing the elements in the room with us. But we know that you are praying with us and we are grateful and we're wishing you a very Merry Christmas. So when you've, after the, the communion is over and you finish partaking of your elements, just leave the cup on the pew beside you and we will take care of it later. So let us go to God together and the communion liturgy. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us even though we were sinners, and that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. In the beginning, when darkness covered the face of the earth and nothing existed but chaos, your spirit swept across the waters. You spoke but a word and a light separated light from darkness. In the fullness of time, you gave your only son, Jesus Christ, to be our savior. And at his birth, the angels sang, glory to you in the highest and peace to your people on earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and we join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. As Mary and Joseph went from Galilee to Bethlehem and there found no room, so Jesus went from Galilee to Jerusalem and was rejected. As in the poverty of a stable Jesus was born, so by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. As your word became flesh, born of woman, on that night, so on the night in which he gave himself up for us, 
he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the righteousness, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us who are gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine and make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By the same spirit, heal us in body, mind, and spirit, cleansing away all that would separate us from you. And by your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, if you will prepare your elements, the thinnest of foils on the top is a layer that covers just the wafer. Peel that back and reveal the wafer. And as you do, and as you lift it from the cup, will you remember that this is the body of Christ broken for you? Thanks be to God. And as you remove the larger foil and look upon the cup, will you be reminded that Jesus said his blood is given for us, the blood of Christ shed for us. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite your attention to the video for our uh, musical response presented by Milton and Patty Lawton's granddaughter, Charlotte. Thank you, Pat.
event offering tonight. We'll be going for Gulf Coast Hurricane Relief uh, Mission sponsored by our church. There's an offering plate in the North X, which you can leave your Advent offering for you at home online. You can go to Ann Street, UMC, or UnitedMethodistChurch.org. Please hear this prayer of dedication of our Advent offering. With these gifts, O oh God, bring light to your people and love to the earth. With our lives, shine light into the deepest shadows and help us to share your love where it is needed most. In the loving name we pray, amen. Thanks be to God that this evening we have been able to join together in person and online and blessings to you for being with us. And as the Herdman family reminded us uh, this evening, not all things go as planned. And we were expecting to have our service outdoors at five and three, and we brought them inside. We were expecting that Candace could be with us to play the organ, but the storm started blowing down east and got worse. And just as she left, even parts of the organ started to fail. So we're very grateful that Brandon has saved Christmas Eve for us this evening. Thank you, Brandon. And we even had grand plans about going outside. We had it all worked out. I got special candles ordered that we're going to use next year, I'm determined, because they have a special cup that comes up and covers the sides of the light, the clear cup, so that the wind's not supposed to blow it out. Well, the wind blew it out at 5 o'clock. Because God himself blew that candle out when I walked out that door, getting ready to lead us in carol singing. So we've got carol sheets. I hope you'll get take it. We won't be able to, uh, to stop and sing outside because I, I think we're going to blow away. But take a carol sheet and take it home and sing it with your family. Uh, and next year, Lord willing, let's all pray next year. A lot of things will look a lot more normal, won't they? But that's all right. God's taught us a lot about Bethlehem this evening. So we go forth. Will you rise for the benediction? And be sure and take a poinsettia. We've got plenty. And they tonight's the night that you take them home. Even if you didn't dedicate one, I know that there are plenty up here. And you're welcome to take them home. May you go forth now in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
reminded that God's love is everywhere and in every place, and especially in those places where we are vulnerable, where we are caught up in something larger than ourselves, and that it's God's way tonight of helping us remember that a Savior is born to us. Amen. Son and Holy Spirit and Ann Street United Methodist Church, we welcome you, good friends, to uh, come and hear this music. We're so thankful that you're here, and we're looking forward to sharing it with you. Especially, we're thankful for our uh, choir, our uh, director of music, and our organist, uh, Joe and Candace, uh, and for the uh, musicians and instrumentalists that are with us this evening. We, we welcome you and thank you for sharing this time, too. As we uh, come into this uh, service and program, uh, you were reminded that there is a special love offering for this service. Uh, there are baskets uh, in the narthex and going out the other way, I believe, right? But going out both ways. Uh, and this is to benefit the uh, Ocracoke Island schools. In fact, it will go straight to the teachers uh, who have uh, uh, lost so much of their own belongings trying to um, pro provide for their classrooms. The school system can basically get the school buildings up and running, we hope, more or less. Um, but it's the teachers who have, as you know, teachers like Joe and Candace who uh, give so much and of their own uh, resources to stock the classrooms with supplies and, and all the rest. And this uh, money will go right to helping them do that uh, on Ocracoke. So thank you so much for in advance for your generosity and uh, your spirit uh, in, in uh, helping them. Uh, tonight's program is Christmas Dreams, a cantata by Joseph Martin and Heather Sorensen. Uh, once you give thanks to uh, God and to these uh, who are uh, uh, playing and singing tonight as the cantata begins.
Throughout time, God has spoken to his people in dreams and visions, in the peacefulness of sleep and the serenity of contemplation, God speaks hope into longing hearts. Through the ancient prophets and devoted visionaries, he reveals the great designs of his creative purpose. It is good and right that in this wondrous season, we gather to remember, to reflect, to renew. Let us quiet our hearts and listen. Let us clear our minds and learn. Let us calm our spirits and live. Tonight, in the still, sacred places of our worship, in the fragile yearnings of our broken dreams, may we seek and discover the grace that changes everything. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Isaiah 9, 6. And more for me. 
God's people, there was a deep longing for reconciliation. The nation yearned for a redeemer, a great Messiah, who would return and reestablish the temple and recreate a kingdom of peace. During those dark days of waiting, the prophets of God offered words of challenge and encouragement. Daniel saw a new hope for the nation. Isaiah foresaw a new peace founded in justice and truth. Hosea spoke of divine love and unending grace, and Zechariah proclaimed a day of joy and spiritual victory. God heard the prayers of his people, and in the fullness of time, the dream for a new covenant would be a reality. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the old covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. But this is the covenant which I make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Jeremiah 31, 31 to 33.
The ancient prophets also foresaw the coming of a new day of truth and justice. In dreams, visions, and even angelic visitations, their faithful servants gave witness to the promises of God and called the people to repent and prepare. They stirred the hearts of the people and gave them a hope that one day God would send a redeemer. With bold exclamations, the prophets called the children of God from their dreams and into action. Awake, awake, put on your strength, O Zion. Jerusalem, put on your beautiful garments. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Now is the hour for you to wake from your sleep. Salvation is near, Isaiah 52. Just persons. They had no children who were well past childbearing years when Zachariah was visited by the angel Gabriel. 
Gabriel told Zechariah that he would have a son who would be a forerunner of the Messiah. He was told to consecrate his son and name him John. This declaration was beyond Zechariah's wildest dreams. Amazed and unable to accept this miraculous news, he initially doubted the angel and was rendered mute until the baby was born. After nine months of silence and reflection, Zechariah was released from his silence and he immediately began singing praise to the Lord. It was clear that Jesus, the chosen one, was coming soon and that John was to go before him. Praise, <clears throat> praise be to the Lord, God of Israel, because he has come to his people and redeemed them. And you, John, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him. Luke 1:68.
wife, Elizabeth, had a cousin who was a young as a girl from the small village of Nazareth. The girl's name was Mary, and she had been chosen by God to be the mother of Jesus, who was the Messiah. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel visited Mary and announced to her the miracle that was soon to happen in her life. Amazed and troubled at the angel's proclamation, she listened devotedly as Gabriel spoke. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you should call his name Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Luke 1, 30, 33. just man to be Mary's husband. When he discovered she was expecting a child of the Holy Spirit, he pondered how to compassionately address the dilemma. Even as he considered this most unusual situation, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, 
and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took Mary as his wife, and in the fullness of time she bore a son, and he called his name Jesus. Matthew 1, 20, 25. <clears throat> Thank you. 
It was a night of miracles and wonders when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Mary and Joseph had been compelled to travel in order to register for the census ordered by the Roman authorities. When the time came for Mary to deliver her baby, Joseph was unable to find accommodations for them. The city was overrun with pilgrims and the only place available was a rugged stable behind a traveler's lodge. In this humble shelter intended for animals, the Son of God was born into this world. Mary wrapped her newborn son in swaddling clothes to keep him warm through the night. Under his earthly parents' loving gaze, the infant Jesus rested and dreamed upon a bed of golden straw. It would not be long before the news of Jesus' birth would be made known. Once again, angels were entrusted to deliver the important declaration. Hear the words of scripture. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. The angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. He will be assigned to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Luke 2, 8 and 14. <laughs>
far from the village of Bethlehem, there were magi who had been observing an unusually brilliant light that had appeared in the night skies. These stargazers were diligently seeking answers for this celestial phenomenon. And as they researched the ancient writings, they became convinced that the star was a sign from heaven. Trusting in their discovery, they formed a caravan and began to follow the star as it arched across the night skies. The scriptures tell us the thoughts and intentions of these dreamers of light. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Matthew 2, 1 and 2.
our songs and spirits together to recall the birth of Jesus the Messiah. We have heard the good news and we are forever changed. We are now free to hope, believe, and become all that we were meant to be. Let us begin the true work of Christmas and dare to dream of a better world, a greater joy, a deeper faith. Let us celebrate the graceful promises that are ours in Christ Jesus. Let us hold on to the divine hope that pursues us through every challenge of the heart and every illness of the mind and body. Let us rest secure in the grace that brings peace that is beyond all understanding. For no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, neither has it entered into the dreams of anyone, the wondrous things that God has prepared for those who love him. 1 Corinthians 2, 9.
And now, dreamers, rise and shine, for your light has come. Hope now dazzles where once there was only darkness. Love now sings where once there was only silence. And now celebrates joy where once there was only sorrow. Go now in peace and take the dream of Christmas to all the world.
Yes, indeed. We all want to thank Joe, Candace, and all of the musicians, uh, singers, and instrumentalists for this evening and all the volunteers who've helped. Let's thank them again as they... Uh, Will you go now from this place with a closing prayer? Oh God, we thank you this evening that as we honor these musicians and their hard work, as we prepare an offering for the teachers of Ocracoke, as we look forward to the season in which you will be known, uh, we thank you, oh God, for coming to us in Jesus and giving us this greatest message of hope for all the world. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for remembering the offering as you go, and have a wonderful evening.